So it's very apt that we've been talking about creative and imaginative ways of get, getting around bureaucracy, because that is precisely what my merchant of Syria did all his life. It is clearly a characteristic of this part of the world that in order to function, you have to find ways around the system. That, that's sort of the baseline. So this book came out of my original book, My House in Damascus, completely accidentally. The merchant himself makes a brief appearance in this book as the father of somebody I met by chance on a Syrian air flight to Damascus. And so I became friends with that family. And so I knew the merchant himself for the last eight years of his life. And so when he died, the family came to me and said, look, will you write his story? Because we feel, uh, we tried, even when he was alive, to write about him, to, to encourage him, to allow people to write something. And he always said, no, 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 don't bother about me. Go off and lead your own lives. But now that he's dead, he can't stop us anymore. <laughs> so, so that's why they came to me to ask me to do this. Initially, it started as a private thing. They just wanted it done for the family as a record. So they set up loads of interviews and things for me. And as I gradually started to accumulate all this material, I, I could see that it was a bigger story than that. It could be a model for Syrian youth who are so desperate in today's times, who feel as if they've lost everything, come through so many tra tragedies. And this would give them a model of how, in spite of all of that, you could still be a successful person and a good person. So that's why, just to explain about the cover a little bit, the, um, the merchant himself is a cloth merchant, born in, in Homs in 1921. So born into the very beginning of the French Mandate period. And we made the cover to look like cloth, because this cloth is actually Yorkshire broadcloth. That's what he was trading in Syria. And I'll explain how far back this goes. And uh, the lettering is designed to look like <coughs> stitching, like embroidery. And the, the kind of vignette is meant to suggest <laughs> constant regeneration, constant revival. So that's why we called it a history of survival as the subtitle. Because again and again in the researches, I was coming across these stories that looked as if there's no way out for this. You're up against a complete impasse of bureaucracy. And yet, they always found another way. You, if you're confronted with a big brick wall, you don't try to knock it down. That's a waste of energy. You find a way around it. And so what I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take you through his life and explain to you why it is a model, really, for, for, for young Syrians to follow, and indeed for us to learn so much as well uh, about the way this man lived his life. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm take you through it, actually. I'm not going to go to the end yet. I'll, 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 I'll show you how it works. So um, I'm told that I have to point this there. So it may, oh, sorry, it may, maybe, maybe, it may just in case you block the signal. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you move into no. my health seat just here? Um, so here we have a map of the Ottoman Empire at its peak. And you can see immediately that, just from the location, that the whole of the Ottoman Empire is essentially about trade. It's a huge, multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic conglomerate, really. A huge single market of trade. And all these lines, colored lines, are not real borders. There were no real borders in the Ottoman Empire. These are administrative borders for the purposes of tax collection, because the Ottomans were very keen on everybody trading freely with each other so that they could then take the taxes. And so, in a sense, this was a, a, a giant single market. And, and look at the size of Syria as it was under the Ottomans. And remember, this was for 400 years the Ottomans ruled Syria. It's, Damascus is pretty much in the middle. It, it was called Greater Syria, Natural Syria, because its borders were natural. Um, and so 
Greater Syria included Jerusalem, of course. It included uh, Gaza and the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. All of that was part of, part of Syria. Now this, we're in Istanbul now. This is the Shamsi Pasha Mosque on the Üsküdar shore, the Asian shore of the Bosphorus. And this is my merchant's and ancestor, the original Shamsi Pasha, Ahmad Shamsi Pasha. And he was born in the 1550s. Uh, he was an exact contemporary, interestingly, of Sinan, the great architect. And both men lived until they were virtually 90. Astonishing lifespan for that, for that period. And both men worked under and collaborated with three consecutive Ottoman sultans. So <coughs> Ahmed Shemsi Pasha was the hunting companion to Suleiman the Magnificent, then the drinking companion of Selim II, or Selim the Sot, as he was known, and, and then the confidant of Murad III. So you can see what a diplomat this man must have been, who <laughs> have been. stayed you know, on the right side of mm -hmm. those three people. And also on his death, or in advance of his death, he, he, uh, he had this um, complex built with his, with his mosque, um, and he oversaw the building of it in a typical uh, way with, with a madrasa attached to the library. Um, and he was asked, why, why have you built your mosque? Because he had his palace close by. Why are you there rather than opposite? Because of course this is directly opposite the top Kapi palace. Why aren't you over there in the thick of the power where, where the sultans are? And he said, because here I can keep myself out of all the political intriguing and I can receive the cream of the gifts from everybody, all the delegations coming from the east. So he was very wily, and, and clearly this, this is the, 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 the mentality that he managed to pass on down through the generations. So this is now the, um, the Ottoman province of Syria itself, and you can see that it's again subdivided into further areas. Again, there are administrative boundaries for tax purposes, there are subdivisions, um, and so Gaza, was a sub-province even in Ottoman times. And then this one is Tripoli. Beirut fell within the province of Tripoli then. Tripoli was far more important as a port then. And then, uh, there's, sorry, this is Acre and then Tripoli. And then uh, Aleppo at the top and then Damascus, the, the largest one. But again, Damascus is in the center there. So this is now in the 1550s. So, my merchant, the original uh, Shamsi Pasha, his ancestor, as a reward for um, loyal service, he was sent by Suleiman the Magnificent to be the governor of Damascus. And so he was in Damascus supervising the construction of this, the, the Tekiya Suleimania, which many of you may recognize, on the banks of the River Barada in Damascus. And so this is a scene from that time uh, and this is when the very first coffee shops grew up, anywhere in the world, because all the pilgrims were gathering here on the banks of the Barada River, ready to do the pilgrimage. Uh, the, the main responsibility of the Ottomans was to, uh, was to enable and, and to, to secure the, the passage of, of pilgrims to Mecca safely. About half the coffers of the empire were apparently channeled into this. It, it gave them legitimacy. And uh, so everybody was waiting there, and entrepreneurs saw an opportunity. Uh, the mocha was traded out from Yemen, and coffee shops grew up along the banks. So these are the original ancestors of Starbucks, if you like. This is the, the, the very first time. And, and here is a Hajj procession, the, the, the pilgrimage, setting off from, from Mecca, sorry, from, from Damascus, heading out and the women are watching from the rooftops there, and everybody went together because it was far too dangerous to try to make this trip alone. You, you'd get, you'd get uh, looted, you'd get kidnapped, you know, you'd, get, you'd get everything stolen from you. And there's a rather nice story I came across of a group of Iranian pilgrims who came across wanting to join the Hajj, 
in Damascus, but they, were, they got the timing wrong, and they arrived two days late. So that it had left without them. So they thought, well, we'll wait till next year then. <laughs> and so they just stayed in, uh, in Damascus uh, and waited till the following year. Now this is in the souk in Damascus. This is the original Bedestan, or Khan, which mm. Ahmed Shemsi Pasha, the original uh, ancestor, built to house the broadcloth. Because he saw, as governor of Damascus, uh, he stumbled upon the, uh, this wonderful cloth from Yorkshire and decided <coughs> that this could be this could be a real gold mine for him. So he began the trade of it. Um, this is in the 1550s. Just imagine that Yorkshire broadcloth is being traded out to Syria then. This is actually part of a bigger picture of the Elizabethan Brexit, if you like. Elizabeth I, excommunicated by Europe, um, needed to find other markets for her for, for British goods. And um, <laughs> historians have done programs about this, believe it or not. It, it, uh, I, I explore it a little in, in the book as well. And uh, so he decided that this commodity was so precious that he had to build a stone domed khan to protect it, to protect it from fire, from looting. And so it's another example of how uh, commercial. Uh, necessity drove invention, if you like. But, so this is the very first example of a harm with a stone dome. Before that, they'd always been wooden. But he really wanted to protect his very, very valuable cloth inside. And this is still here. I saw it, uh, I took these photos in, in April this year. Now, this is the merchant. Now, we're coming to my actual merchant. Now, that was the, the history, if you like, how he got to be where he is now. So here he is, aged six. Look what he's wearing, broadcloth, because everybody in those days wore a suit of, of English broadcloth, and it, lost, it lasted <coughs> supremely well. Um, at this age, he's in Homs. The population of Homs is one-third Christian, two-thirds Muslim, and so he's going to school and is taught by nuns. It's mixed, boys and girls together, uh, completely normal. This is what's happening all over Syria. Um, the, best, the best schools are run by nuns, and so that's where the, 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 the children whose parents care more about their education will, will send them there. And he's the, he's the only boy uh, among seven sisters. Now this is a map that the French drew under the mandate to try to work out all the different ethnic groupings, relig religious and ethnic groupings in Syria. So this is an extraordinary map which hasn't seen the light of day for really a very long time. Um, the original is in the Institut Francais in Damascus, and it was drawn up in 1935. And the French sent sh uh, soldiers off into all the villages to, to compile this information. And it gives us a fascinating snapshot of how everything was in 1935. Um, the areas where there's nothing shaded in is because that's largely desert and largely uninhabited. But you can see from this that um, the majority population is Sunni Muslim. That's roughly 70% of the population, um, which is pretty much still what it is. Uh, and then all the different other groupings are shown. So the, you have the, the Shiites, the Alawites, the Chechens, the Ismailis, the Druze, the Yazidis, the Turkomans, the Kurds, the Turks, the, the Turkmens, the Maronites, and then the Greek Catholics, the Greek Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, the Armenians, and on it goes. There are 17 different denominations of Christianity, all still active, believe it or not, in, in Syria. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful example of how blended the society is. It's interesting to look at the Kurdish areas at the mm. top there and compare it uh, with what's happening today as well. So we're back to Homs now. This is the entrance to the main mosque in Homs. And one of the things that came out in, uh, in my researches was how religion and commerce go side by side. It doesn't matter what religion, uh, Islam, Christianity, whatever it is, um, religion and commerce 
are the two constants in people's lives. Politically, everything is total chaos, turmoil, all over the place, currencies all over the place, impossible, I mean, the opposite of a stable business environment. So the two things that people learn to do um, are to stick to the constants. And in Hobbes, this is the entrance um, to the other entrance to the mosque, because the mosque is right beside the souks, so that at prayer time, the owners of the shops can go straight in to pray. As you know, Muslims pray five times a day, so they will break off and, and go to pray. And in that time, the Christians would look after the shop of the Muslims. It's completely normal. Um, the shop that my merchant had, he had Christian neighbors on either side. And on Sunday, when the Christians went to church, the Muslims would look after his shop for him. This is completely normal all over Syria, just the same. Now, this is the merchant aged 12. You can see he's still got his suit, but now he's got a tie, which means he has become an adult now, because, tragically, his father died very suddenly when he was 10, and he was catapulted to become the head of the household. He had seven sisters and the mother to look after suddenly. And so that was the end of his schooling, age 10, so he remained actually semi-illiterate all his life. Um, and he had to go and look after the shop, the textile shop, in the souk, and try to support the family. The uncle, um, he had an uncle who helped him slightly, but who was a slightly dubious influence and wanted to keep all the best customers for himself. And so there was a, a bit of a strained relationship there. And then, of course, when, uh, when he became older, I'm going to start calling him Abu Shakir now, because that's what everybody called him, in fact. So Abu, Abu Shakir um, was forced by his uncle to marry his cousin, to marry the, the daughter of the uncle, um, which was a disaster. <coughs> the first cousin marriage like that is very common in this part of the world, and it's a way of keeping the money in, in the family, of course, it's what it's all about. Um, and he said it was like marrying my sister. And it, it, was, it was a nightmare. It failed, and they got divorced, but not before, unfortunately, uh, there was a child, a, a daughter. So here, here is, a, this is the street in which Abu Sherkir's shop was, in, in the Homs souk. So here he was, divorced, looking as if everything was um, basically over for him. I mean, how could he possibly ever prosper in this kind of background. You know, the stigma of divorce in that time, very difficult. The family ostracized him for rejecting the uh, daughter. So he was on his own, completely on his own. And just to give a bit of background about the, uh, the textile, textiles in Syria are incredibly important. About a third of the population was involved one way or another, either in the, the manufacturing or the growing of textiles. Um, and this is a loom in, in the, the 1900s in, in Damascus. And this is a typical example of the sort of uh, silk cloth that was, that was woven at the time. And this, the heritage of textiles goes way, way back into Syrian history, um, right back to Palmyra, another big trading city, of course, and um, sitting there in the oasis of the <coughs> desert. And they, um, uh, the textiles, beautiful textiles, were found wrapped around the, the bodies of the mummies in, in the funeral um, tombs, and mixtures of silk and cotton, beautiful colors, exquisite designs going way, way back. So there's a massive heritage of, of textiles in Syria. Now this map, now we're into 1953. So by now, Israel has been created in 1948. So Greater Syria has lost uh, everything to the south there. Jordan has, has been created down there. Uh, Lebanon has been carved out as a separate entity and gets its independence in 1943, and then Syria gets its independence in 46. So all this turmoil is what Abu Shakir was living through, growing up as a, as a teenager, living through these absolutely chaotic times when the French were in charge and the currency was all over the place. They pegged, they pegged the, French, uh, the French franc to the Syrian lira. Um, it was impossible. There were about five different currencies in operation at one time, and people were reduced to barter in the end. They had to bypass everything to find, to find ways 
of, of coping and continuing with their trade. Now this was Homps as it originally was. It's difficult to anybody if you have been to Homps. It is, um, it, I mean, it's not the sort of place that tourists ever went to because there isn't a great deal to see these days. But it did actually have a magnificent citadel, um, which is reminiscent of uh, Aleppo in, in the citadel. Um, and this is what the citadel looks like today. Um, uh, shadow of its former self because and largely it's been out of balance because the Assad regime has made it into a military yeah. um, area with um, you know radio masts and everything um, but it is actually historically of enormous importance because in Homs there was a very very important temple of the sun and that temple is the site of the main mosque in in uh, in Homs today and one of the accidental things that came out of my research is actually in, in, in learning about Homs and this very famous temple was that it was a great place of pilgrimage and um, a Roman emperor on his way to, to put down the um, rebellion of Queen Zenobia in Palmyra um, asked the oracle whether he would win and he was told yes you will win so when he did win he came back and um, poured lots of money on, onto the um, into the, the, the extra buildings around around the temple and it became a huge and very important pilgrimage site and of course a pilgrimage site means money again it means lots of people coming lots of people buying souvenirs um, and what gradually happened was that the the temple which was a temple to the sun god in in Homs, gradually the romans took took this into sol sanctissimus sol invictus and you can see here how he was represented. He's got a halo, which we later, of course, associate with Christianity. You can see how it all merged. And then the, um, the eagle then of, of uh, the bell, the main god of Palmyra. All, all these things merged. And, and then you can see how um, this was gradually taken into Christianity. The, the, the ground was right for monotheism, essentially, because all the gods were merged into this sun god. And so this is now um, the main church in Homs. And like all the, all the churches in, in this part of the world, they, 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 very often they are built on, on the same foundations as the uh, temple of the sun, which is why they face east. Um, all of this just gradually got absorbed and, and moved almost seamlessly. So here, th these are the frescoes inside that, that Homs church on the Zinar. And you can see the halos there, the typical iconography that we're used to in, in, in all our churches. And this is the, the main mosque. This is the actual mosque that was the original Temple of the Sun. And when the Crusaders came, they turned it into a, a cathedral and for 400 years here, Christians and Muslims mm -hmm. shared this space. In Damascus, in the main Umayyad Mosque, they shared it for 100 years. In Homs, they shared it for 400 years. Absolutely astonishing. But this is, it seems astonishing now, but we must remember that this was normal at the time, completely normal. So food, the markets, this is so important um, in Syria. And for, uh, of course, people, you don't have the chance now to go to Syria, but I'm sure many of you have been and, and know, the, know the country. It is self-sufficient in food. Syria produces all its own fresh fruit and vegetables. It actually has a lot of fertile, um, fertile soil, river valleys around the Orontes and, and the Euphrates. Um, and food is a very important part of Syrian culture and was vitally important to my merchant, Amushakir. The food everywhere, the the the, um, the herbs and the spices, all of which, of course, are, are then traded as well. He, as well as trading the broadcloth, he very often had to trade with herbs, you know, s s doing barter things. So he was trading pistachios for cloth, um, you know, special herbs for cloth, all, all all different ways of getting round the, the complex bureaucracy of the time. So. What happened to him there? So he, he, as I explained, everything went wrong for him. He was sitting miserable in his shop in, in Homs, divorced, looking as if he had no future. A friend of his father's passed by, saw how miserable he looked and said, come with me. 
opened his office safe and said, uh, here you are, look, I've just sold all my sheep. He was a sheep trader. I've sold, I've sold them. I've got my safe full of money. I don't need this money for another six months. You take it and go and buy yourself some, some cloth. So with that money, Abu Shakir, no receipt, by the way, nothing, nothing written down. This is, again, completely normal, I have to say, in this part of the world. When somebody's in trouble, you help him. The archives showed it time and time again. So there was a Christian um, merchant in the souk, for example, in, in Homs, who was going bankrupt. The, the Muslim merchants around him said, we don't want him to go bankrupt. It's, it's a bad reflection on us. We'll help him. So they lent him money until he was up on his feet again so that he could become part of the community. This, is, this was just normal, but it was, a, it was just part of the shared community responsibility, the complete opposite of the sort of cutthroat culture that we're used to today where you want to trample your, your, um, your rival, you, know, you want to crush him rather than help him. So the, the mentality was so different. So, so this, this gesture, um, of, of help was really what, what transformed his life. So with that money, he was able to go to Beirut, bought a huge quantity of cloth, and became um, a major merchant, was able to start trading beyond Syria's borders. It coincided with um, very difficult times, the, the rise of the Ba'ath Party in Syria. It became very difficult to be a successful entrepreneur unless you were going to be very corrupt. Um, so in order to avoid all of that, he kept his shop discreetly open in Homs, but actually did all his trading from the free zone here in, in Beirut, the port, the port zone. And we built everything up, was doing incredibly well, and then the Lebanese Civil War broke out in 1975. And his warehouse, the biggest warehouse with the textiles anywhere in the Middle East, was burnt and looted, and he lost everything again. So his life, as you can see, you know, personal tragedy, um, twice he lost everything. So what he decided to do at this point was to come to this country. He decided he needed to secure the source of his cloth. So he came to this country in the late 70s, and in 1980, he bought the mill in Bradford, Brigella Mills, which was the source of the broadcloth that he had always been trading. <coughs> Bradford at that time was in, in a desperate strait. Most mills were closing because of the competition from textiles, um, you know, synthetics and jeans and everything. Abu Shaki had a lifelong hatred of jeans, incidentally. <laughs> His grandchildren were forbidden ever to wear jeans. And um, so he saved this one mill by giving it new customers in the Middle East. And so this mill. Uh, is, is still exists to this day. It's the only mill that is still functioning to this day. And this is how he ended up in the boardroom. Uh, this picture hangs in the boardroom there. He's about 60. Um, and he, he, he was a man of very few words. Uh, one of his friends said he was the only, only man I ever knew who was fluent in five languages without saying a word. <laughs> Not just that. He would just size you up, basically. He just, he just knew. He had an instinct. He didn't have to say very much. Um, but he had a, a natural instinct about who he could trust. And, and he continued, that, I mean, that enormous gesture of trust by the sheep trader to him was something he continued in his own later life. When he had money that he was able to lend, he did so. He, he, he lent young people who he trusted enough money to get themselves up and running. And he said, he said they never lost money that way because it was all based on trust. This is Abu Shaker and the lady mayoress of Bradford planting a tree outside the mill in, in Bradford. And they had their own uh, stationery printed there, Shamsi Pasha Limited, Wool Exchange, Bradford. And, but Abu Shakir, by this stage, having, having established all that, having secured his, his source, if you like, the business group. By this stage, he had four sons, um, and they gradually took over the business. He passed everything over to them, and he wanted to go back to Syria. In spite of everything, in spite of the politics, he was still pulled back to his homeland. He had a very deep connection to his roots. 
and he'd kept his little shop in the hom in the Homsuk all those years, and he wanted to go back there and live the rest of his life out there. And so here he is in his element, smoking his shisha. He was a heavy smoker all his life, never touched a drop of alcohol, but he smoked all his life and still made it to 90. <laughs> 92, in fact. And you can see all the cloth there piled up. And it was the f one of the things that pulled him back was actually the food, too. I mean, he, he, although here he tried to go to fruit markets and buy things in bulk, and, but it was never the same. He, he always talked about you know, the wonderful food. Homs was favorite for, uh, famous for its uh, aubergines there. Uh, 101 things to do with an aubergine. I mean, Homsies were really, um, they would talk for hours about all the dishes that could be made from aubergines and all the, f uh, the dried fruits and nuts and things, all of this, you can't, I can't exaggerate how, what a pull this was, the connection to food that's been grown in your own soil was for them always part of it. it this disconnected thing of going into a supermarket, they, they couldn't stand it. I mean, they just thought it was awful. It meant so much to them. So, so here he is back in Homs then with, with, his, with his wife, um, Rehab, the mother of his four sons. The daughter, incidentally, from the first marriage, um, under Islamic law, she, had to, she was actually brought up by Rehab as well because the, the first wife, his cousin, remarried and at that point the daughter comes automatically to him to look after. So Rehab, as the second wife, had to look after the daughter of the first wife Again, completely normal. In fact, um, she called her mama, you know, and this was, it seems odd to us, but this was the system. And, and actually, they, they all were, you know, got on very well. In fact, the sons said they didn't realize that she was only a half sister until they were quite a lot older. She was just their older sister. She grew up with them, and they're still in touch with them all. And Abu Shakir, as he got older, then would, would still love to go for. They lived in the center of Homs, but he had what he called a farm, just, just a little bit to the north, where he would go every morning at dawn. He would drive himself out there in this beaten up old Fiat, and he would uh, grow, grow plants, check on everything, grow roses, look after animals that had been injured. You can see he's, he's moved on in his headwear now. He's got his baseball cap. He always had a hat for every occasion of Ushaka. Um, but of course then the war came um, out of nowhere and Homs of course became what was known then as the capital of the revolution. Nowhere was bombed more than Homs. Um, and as you probably know, you know, films are now being made about it, the whole Marie Colvin thing, this, this in 2012. This is the same church incidentally, the Umar church that was bombed. Uh, and she, uh, Mary Colvin, was in a media center that was deliberately targeted by the Assad regime in order to cut out any foreign reporting of what was going on. Complete devastation there. So Abu Shakir stayed there um, <coughs> for the first few months of, of the war until it became too dangerous. And then his sons went out and brought him back, brought him back reluctantly, and he had to come back. So th these are the, the souks in Homs. Um, that are actually being started to be rebuilt again now, or not, not completed, and actually it's a horrible story of corruption. Um, but the, this, there has been a move to, um, to, uh, to rebuild them. But Abu Shakir was left in, uh, in London, back in London again, in the little flat that he lived. I mean, all this time, he was never an extravagant person. I mean, he lived in a little two-bedroom flat in central London. Um, very discreetly, but then he would go to the mosque in Regent's Park, and instead of his farm north of Homs, he had to make do with feeding the pigeons. So, so this is his story. It's basically a story of how you can build up an entire empire on trust. That's the remarkable thing. And his customers, I mean, he went for really high level, high end um, uh, cloth and weave. So the Queen and Prince Philip sit on Heald, the name of the firm is called Heald Cloth in the Royal Bentley, believe it or not. And they, they've, it's still a global enterprise now. They, they trade out to the Far East and to America and all over the Middle East as well. Um, and you won't have heard of their name because they are the middle people, if you like. They, they then sell the cloth to the top brands like Aquascutum, you know, the, the top 
fashion brands. So that's why the name Healed means nothing in this country. You say the name Healed in the Middle East, everybody goes, oh yes, Healed. <laughs> because they're, they're familiar with it. People would buy Healed cloth um, on the pilgrimage, for example. Um, they would buy Healed cloth in Mecca to take back as a, pres as a gift for people. It was just a standard way of doing things. And, and the Ayatollah Khomeini wore healed cloth as well. <laughs> so he had an extraordinary range. But what, is, what, it, what really it shows to me is how remarkable it is that the whole thing was built on trust. And to this day, the four sons still run it the same way. They've got British accountants. Um, and the accountants sometimes say, oh, you know, these people owe you some money. Um, you ought to, you ought to get, you ought to get that money back off them. And they say, well, it doesn't matter. We trust these people. They'll pay us back when they're ready. And all his, all his life, he had um, Christian partners, business partners. He had a Jewish accountant. He had Druze partners. It didn't matter at all. I, I met a lot of these people. A lot of them are still alive. I went out to, to Lebanon and met his Christian partners. It didn't matter. All that mattered was, were you honest? Could you, could, you, could you do business with him? And that was it. So, so he can give us uh, a wonderful model of what is possible on trust. Thank you. Okay. Um, just one other thing, actually. I wanted to mention that... Uh, so I've got, a cop I've got the My House in Damascus book here, which incidentally supports uh, a special charity for Syrian higher education. And the Merchant of Syria one, um, I also wanted that to support something relevant. And so that actually supports um, a special charity that we've set up called Culture Through Making to try to revive the craft skills of Syria, which of course have also been horribly um, neglected and damaged now. Um, so I'm just going to leave those there about the charity if anybody is interested in it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's absolutely fascinating. Can you have the light on that on?